You're the Worst. Have you seen the TV show You're the Worst? No. Do they have an app? No. It's on Hulu, which is an app. And I love do it. Do you have Hulu? It's terrible. I do have do Hulu. Do you pay for Hulu? Uh, yes. It's another thing you pay for aside from the New York Times. I also pay for Netflix. HBO? I, not currently. Okay. We only pay when Game of Thrones is on. Dun, 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 dun. Have you heard the goat version of that? No. Ma, 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 ma. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's how you do creepy. Oh my God, they're going to keep this. They're going to keep this. <laughs> and I am going to die. Like nobody's going to take us seriously, Guy. <laughs> That's good. They shouldn't. Everybody takes themselves too seriously. Oh my God. They're going to keep my goat noise. So anyway... We've got a great guest today. We do. We do indeed. We are going to get to talk to Chad Burton about apps, lawyers and technology, and a bunch of other little fun stuff like how he enjoyed practicing as an attorney and then didn't enjoy it so much and enjoyed making technology more. So how about we quit witty bantering and let's dive into the show. Welcome to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. The reboot. Welcome to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing with your hosts, Key Sakalakis and Kelly Street, teaching you how to promote, market, and make fat stacks for your legal practice here on Legal Talk Network. Chad Burton, the guy who people attribute as pioneering the new age of law firms. With that hefty title, welcome to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing, Chad Burton. Hi. I want to know who those people are because they're obviously misguided, but I guess we'll take it, right? Um, I think I found that quote on ABA something. (laughs) Perfect. That's all it needs to be. That is totally credible at that point. (laughs) Guy and I are very excited to be talking with you today about using technology and boosting access to legal services. Awesome. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So can you tell our listeners just a little bit more about yourself and your background? Sure. So I, like many in our little legal tech innovation world, started out practicing law practiced in big firms, small firms, actually started my own firm and grew a virtual law firm model. And then that kind of parlayed into uh, Cura Legal doing tech consulting and outsourcing for solo and small firms, which then developing technology for the industry in general, uh, not just solo and small firms. And today, while running Curo and continuing the tech development, we've also spun off a Venture Studio model and are building a national plug-and-play uh, franchise-like law firm model as well, kind of tying everything together. Very cool. So let me put on my, I'm a lawyer, I've been practicing for 100 years, and I know that I get clients from doing great work, building a reputation, and meeting people. How does technology fit into that soup for me? I mean, I think practically, you know, at this point, it is fitting into everyone's practice one way or another. It just depends on what types of technology and, and how lawyers want to use it. I'm pretty sure just about every lawyer is going to have email at this point or you know, using other related basic technology. <laughs> I'm kind of, well, let me also answer it another way. I'm kind of tired of that narrative that old lawyers don't care about technology. That's not, I'm not aiming at that. At me you. too. I'm talking about no, it in no. general. Okay. No, fire at um, me. No, yeah, I'm why that lawyer. Hell, why, why, I do agree. Answer, why do you answer that question? That's awful. So, I, because I'm, I was getting, your, I the, uh, getting yeah. you to bristle a little bit here. Get you fired up. Yeah. Right. That was, that was hard. It took a little while, didn't it? <laughs> um, it took three minutes. Um, no, I Let's stop it. Like, as far as this concept of 
oh, lawyers are adverse to technology and blah, blah, blah. No, they're not. We are at this really cool spot in the legal tech uh, you know, space in that there's so much coming out and there's so many options nowadays. And I think it is a fair narrative to discuss the fact that some lawyers feel a bit frozen by the number of choices. But at this point, with the exception of those random stories where you hear somebody, you know, got dinged with an ethics violation because I think it was a North Carolina lawyer or something refused to get an email address. Those are outliers at this point. Most of the lawyers I talk to on a daily basis are actually excited about technology and want to use it better. So I think it has a role for everyone. And this whole lawyers are slow to adopt, I think is just, um, it's been used in different contexts. Maybe part of it is as a sales mechanism to try to spur the legal industry forward. But I just, I would be fine with that maybe, you know, five, seven, eight years ago. But I think that's just changed now. You know, I appreciate you saying that as a, I mean, even a person who's not a lawyer and never was. I think it is becoming more of a being afraid of all of the options out there or not, I shouldn't say afraid, being frozen by all of the options out there, as you said, and being overwhelmed. I had that conversation with a solo, a new solo last week who wanted to do all of these different marketing things, but said she was just super confused. And there, there are so many options out there now. How do you know which one to go with? Right. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's, and it's not a bad problem to have because if you think, let's say 10 years ago, especially in the solo small firm world, that's when uh, Rocket Matter and Clio launched. They're both celebrating, I think, their 10th anniversary, or it did recently. They were kind of the entry uh, points to the cloud-based, maybe modern era of technology. And so back then, you had very few choices. But now, yeah, there's a lot. So how do you... I mean, that's, that's part of the challenge now is figuring out what to use in your law firm. But at the same time... I think people are figuring out and realizing you just need to try things. And it was just a week ago, I was was talking to a lawyer who had reached out to me for uh, some help and random person. I don't, I don't know him so I can use this. He's not in a kind of this traditional small world of legal tech innovation. And he had started a firm after being a equity partner in a large firm for he said 25 years. And he said, yeah, I spent the past couple of weeks. I started my firm. I brought a hundred clients with me, but the first couple of weeks I spent setting up my practice management software, learned how to use QuickBooks online, set up my Google for our G suites or whatever they're calling it nowadays, uh, the Google email system. And I'm off and running. Yeah, I could use it better, but I'm good. I'm, I'm moving. This isn't that hard. Yeah. It's, it's kind of fascinating where you just have to sometimes pick things and move. Definitely. So I know, and you talked to so many lawyers, so you have uh, such a great lay of the land for what are some of the most common questions and issues that lawyers are facing. What tend to be getting beyond just the this idea of being tech adverse and even beyond just the kind of paralysis by options, what types of things are, are lawyers asking about um, that are causing them problems in terms of or challenges that they're facing that they're trying to solve at the intersection of whether you want to call it client development, marketing and technology. Like, is it a, are there specific, like, you know, questions that you hear over and over again that relate to an implementation or a product or is it all over the map? Um, I mean, in some regards, it's all over the map. Recently, what we have been seeing a lot of, and it's firms who are, really looking to step up their game. They have a solid practice or are you know, moving towards the goals that they have, but they want better systems and processes. So it, maybe it's using new technology, but it's leveraging what they have better, but also you know, focusing on data-driven decision-making, especially um, when you're talking about it in the context of um, client acquisition, and they've got leads from different places coming in from a whole bunch of different sources, whether it's, you know, Avo, their website, uh, traditional referral sources, but they want to make sure that they are optimizing the conversion of those leads, both through the technology and systems and processes, but using the, the human factor as well, making sure that they're leveraging all of that in conjunction. So 
I think that it's really an optimization point and kind of stepping up your game in a way, I guess is a way to, to think about it. And that's been a trend that we've been seeing quite a bit. And probably a lot of that has to do in those discussions have to do with our plug and play law firm model I was talking about earlier, where that's where a lot of these conversations are happening. Yeah. Can you talk more about what your plug and play law firm model is if people aren't familiar with it? Sure. They're probably not because we're ramping it up now. Um, so it's a company separate from uh, Cura Legal, actually. Billy Tracio and I have started this with some other folks, and we are building out a concept for uh, – it's called – I don't think I said it. It's Modern Law Practice is the name of the company and the, the concept. But we are building systems and processes and, and technology so that – it lawyers and firms can plug into a standardized solo or small firm practice. Everything focusing from intake systems through the the end of the case. And you know, that's a model we're building and we're uh, implementing it across the country. So that's kind of fun. A little bit different than we've done before, but really looking at a standardized approach. One, because that will help the individual lawyers be able to optimize their particular practice. But at the same time, from a bigger picture perspective, we're going to be able to better inform the industry as to the direction of solo and small firms as we uh, gather data and can inform in the aggregate the trends that we see. Very cool. And is that practice area specific or is that going to be more like who's the target audience there? Is it really anybody that's a solo small firm lawyer? You know, Ultimately, it is not practice area specific. However, we are working with uh, business lawyers and family law lawyers right now, getting out of the gate, those two demographics. Cool. So referencing what Guy said about how you have all of these, um, you're so connected to the solo and small law firm community and having a solo firm yourself in the past, is there anything that you think is sort of missing in law firm marketing and client development, any kind of technologies that need to be developed that could help lawyers do better marketing and have better and happier clients at their firms? Actually, there's a reason why we're building this model that I just talked about is because we think that's missing, that standardization model. So we will be building some technology related to data analytics that go along with it, uh, leveraging some existing technology, but there's an opportunity for a more focus on data in very specific ways that can inform not only general health of a practice, but you know, getting to uniform billing models and things like that. So I think there's, there's some data opportunities that are out there, but that's uh, when I think about what's missing. I guess there's that plus, and I, I don't want to go derail into another area that gets me fired up pretty quickly, but talking about uh, regulatory issues. No, let's go there. Let's go there. You don't go there? Okay. You know, regulatory issues that are blocking lawyers' ability to get work, which is a way of leveraging technology. So when you see opinions from different states, including my own here in Ohio, which say basically anti-AVO type opinions where AVO is leveraging their marketing power and technology to help consumers get connected with lawyers and are handing lawyers work, lawyers who want work, it, it basically handing them and, you know, yes, charging a marketing fee because that's reasonable. You two know more than, you know, better than anyone as far as the idea that, yeah, lawyers are paying for Google, you know, AdWords, other Facebook, social media, where they're paying to get clients in the door, same kind of model, but states are blocking the ability for lawyers to leverage those those opportunities out there, and and that's a uh, we're seeing some positive trends. Um, Illinois, Oregon are working towards some. Um, I don't know if their rules or opinion. I think their rule changes to allow for private lawyer referral services. But that's a problem that I've seen, and something. It's, I guess it's it's a way of looking at what's missing because there is work. You know, we have this. You hear different numbers, but Billions and billions of dollars of untapped legal services are out there. People who need access to legal services and want them. And then you have lawyers or who are saying, hey, I want work. And then if we are using regulations to block the ability to connect those two, that's pretty absurd to me. And protectionist and 
fill in a bunch of other words there. So that's that's something I think that we've been seeing the trend you know, going backwards a little bit lately. But then, you know, like I said, with a, at least a couple places, we see some forward looking trends as well. So call up your state Supreme Court justices. That's right. <laughs> find where they're having lunch. No, don't do that. That's right. <laughs> that go to the Red Hen and no, wait, that's different. Never mind. Uh, too soon. I too mean, soon. you. Uh, these things do need to change because Guy and I, we had a client at Attorney Think who cited their state rules that they can't use. Apparently. Uh, they cannot use a client testimonial and they were afraid of having an ethics violation if they did so. And that kind of thing is just, I mean, it's insane that those are the kind of rules that lawyers have to follow in states. Yeah. I mean, it's not only are we seeing from some of the states, you know, state uh, progress, but there are also some groups I'm involved with them in different ways of kind of functioning outside the bar world that are really looking at, you know, focusing on data, but also uh, looking at using data and trends to inform uh, redrafting rules. And it's a little different than we've seen in the past, but I would say it's more of a grassroots kind of effort to start moving those trends in the right direction because it's it's going to have to be you know taken care of. And um, I just there's a Twitter conversation going on for I think all of yesterday on this topic and. It just and that seems to happen about once a week, and it's it's produced some good outside of Twitter action, not just tweets, because that isn't actually doing anything. That's talking some about IRL it. action in real life. There's real life stuff happening. Absolutely, nice. it's magical. That's great. So I want to pull us because we could go into the uh, rule stuff for forever, um, and I'm you know get very fired up about that too. Let's, but I don't know if our listeners beyond what they could do to influence what's going on in their state during their lunch hour here. Uh, Let's try to pull it back to, and I know this is kind of a big topic and uh, there's a whole probably process and system for doing this, but what are some of the questions that lawyers should be asking themselves about choosing technology as it pertains to client development? I know that's that's really broad and vague, but I, I think so many lawyers, like they don't even know where to get started so they you know whether they get pitched on a software or they go to a tech show or a, some kind of legal marketing conference like how do you even start those conversations or brainstorming with lawyers uh, who are trying to make some of these choices about client development and technology it is a big topic because it really it just depends on where they're starting some have done some research some have not at all and are looking for a way to get started and become educated on it. So, I mean, it really is all over the board. So first and foremost, you got to look at where they are, what they've already explored themselves. What are they using? What what have they tried in the past that maybe works and doesn't work? And so, I mean, that's where the conversation has to start because everyone is coming from different angles uh, for sure. One of the applications we developed with the uh, American Bar was avablueprint.com that we launched about, I guess, a year and a half ago. And we're working on a second version that's going to go live here in August. But that came from a focused discussion where, you know, aiming at a demographic that you're talking about there, where it's these are folks who are solo and small firms who know they need to do things, but just don't know where to get started. And so we came up with a version one that brought in a select group of vendors that were operational and also marketing oriented so that uh, we could introduce a subset of lawyers that had really never thought about these issues, introduce them to the concepts. And it, it worked very well because, well, one, we saw that lawyers were actually engaging and signing up for services, which is great. But at the same time, they were also, many of them were learning for the first time about some of these tools. So what would happen, it felt a lot like when we were doing our consulting, and that's kind of what we modeled this after. Uh, You can make all the recommendations in the world, but lawyers still like to learn for themselves. So what we would do through Blueprint is They could go through and answer a bunch of questions, and Blueprint was making recommendations for them to sign up for. And so what they do is go outside of Blueprint, go do a bunch of research, 
Um, and we, we know this was happening because we would see it through the uh, live chat feature and, and other avenues within Blueprint. They would go out, do a bunch of research, come back, and then either make purchases or sign up for consulting help because now they had some questions. Even if they didn't sign up for what was included with Blueprint, that's a huge win because this is, for the first time, a lot of these folks are looking at these concepts and thinking about them and figuring out how to implement them in their practice. So that's a big, and like I said, it kind of went along the lines of when we did consulting for smaller firms where we would get hired by some firms or lots of firms, but a lot of them we would do assessments for and make recommendations, spend a lot of time you know, discussing, learning about their firms and goals, et cetera. And then at the, you know, the end of the day, we make recommendations and most firms would, it would trigger some, you know, a lot of discussions and, and maybe some additional research, which was pretty cool. And then we could move on to implementation from there. But everyone's in lots of different places. So that's what we've tried to do with Blueprint, for example, is, is try to help move that along so that it, it limits the unknown for people. Cool. So you said that you would do kind of an assessment with small firms. What are some of the benchmark things that you were looking for related to marketing and client development? Most of the firms that we would work with had very little in place strategically. And we still hear this a lot today, but you know, where it's, well, I get most of my referrals from word of mouth and friends and family and colleagues and things like that. So we looked for what was in place first and foremost, to the extent that there were, uh, they had services and they were, you know, focused on, you know, whether through the website or social media, we would obviously dive in and look at the effectiveness of that as well, see if it was working and is it bringing the types of clients they want into the firm or is it generating you know, not wasting their time, but not something that's in line with their goals. So that's oftentimes if the, actually this is where um, we bring in folks like you that have way more expertise on it, but just even looking for a benchmark to see if something is in place. Because when we're talking technology, it seems, at least from the, the firms that we worked with, they wanted to start with operations before jumping into the marketing part which is interesting because you you have this constant chicken and egg thing going where they need the clients to pay for the stuff they need to run a better firm they need to be more efficient and you know be able to process clients and and do the work better but they need the clients in in too so so that's a, a lot of what we would see we know those chickens and eggs i'm sure you've yes. you've had a lot of them yeah even as a business ourselves, uh, we have the same issues. It's, it is all about running a business and how to handle all of the different elements of that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So one of the other things that I thought Chad might be an expert and innovator or what else? Innovation, automation, streamlining, law practice, life, future technology person on. So uh, you're familiar <laughs> with a, a lot of the landscape of legal tech in general. And one of the things that's been recently coming up, uh, at least on our horizon, is this idea of apps for law firms. So not just like all of the different legal tech apps, but an app developer actually building an app for a law firm. You know, some of them I look at it and I'm like, well, technically, yes, this is an app. You can download it to your phone but it's not really doing anything beyond maybe serving as like a business card for the law firm. Right. One, is this even a topic you want to say anything about? But I'd kind of like to get your thoughts on if you've seen these law firm specific apps and if you've seen any that have been, you think are interesting and what are they actually doing? The ones that I've seen that are interesting to me, you know, yeah, I've seen the, well, for years since iOS, in the iOS store, you see, law firm apps that really are just business cards where you can make a phone call or um, which are fine. And that gets on the, the app bandwagon. But I think the ones that I've seen recently are focused on really helping to facilitate the conversation and the communication between the law firms and the clients. 
whether it's integrating with different types of practice management software that leverages that or what the key is you know, we know this you know from a a client happiness standpoint and from a you know why most ethics complaints arise it's because of lack of communication and obviously that has so many tentacles to it because a lack of communication it's not that people that lawyers have a problem talking it's while they're behind they probably haven't done the work so you don't hear from them so they don't want to respond to your inquiries because their systems and processes suck so it just is spiraling out of control but if you can use an app to help facilitate conversation whether it's something along the lines of actual messaging back and forth but sharing of deadlines or documents and things like that then i think that that's an effective way for law firms to leverage an app with their clients. And it ultimately becomes, I think, a sales and marketing tool for them. Because when you look at clients who are looking, consumers who are looking to hire lawyers, obviously they want somebody that's going to communicate with them, that's going to do a good job, that is not going to break the bank, hopefully. And you know, tools like that, apps like that will be very useful for purposes of saying, this is this is how we can you know, deal with all of that. We have this constant communication back and forth and sharing of information that is automated. And as a result, that means we serve you better and your outcomes are better because we're on top of things. That's a good sales tool for me, from my perspective. No, totally. Absolutely. So I uh, put you on the spot. Give me your top five. Who do you like for that, for the client communication <laughs> stuff? Oh, okay. Do you mean law firm specific type oh, tools well, or? Yeah, I was I was thinking more like, because I, I thought that your response to that was very useful in terms of if we just narrow it down and make a priority of the options for a firm. So option number one might be like, yeah, you could hire a developer to build your own messaging uh, right. thing. That's probably not as cost effective. I don't know. Is it cost effective now? Uh, probably not. No. Okay. Two, well, it depends. It depends yeah, on your firm. It depends right. on your type of firm. Yeah, yeah, right. If you're a big firm, maybe it's worth rolling your own. Or you're a solo just swimming in cash and you know, <laughs> waking up on a bed of money. That's You could do it that yeah, way. Too. The average solo. The average right. solo. Right. Um, what, uh, do you see a trend with that? Do you see more moving towards building their own tools versus buying licenses? I Not really. The discussions we've had recently where folks have reached out to us that may be in a law firm or in maybe in-house, for example, where they have an idea they want to develop. Yes, it's something they want to use within their firm, but their real goals, you know, and I think this is smart for obvious reasons, but their real goal is to you know, create something that scales, but they're trying to solve a problem within their world, which is where a lot of good ideas start, naturally. So I haven't seen it from the standpoint of, like, I just want to use it in my firm and not expand beyond that. We have seen some, and we, this is actually since Cura started, we've seen this off and on, where firms have specific needs or workflows that they like, and the technology that's out there just doesn't get it done, where maybe they're using... Google for work, or I keep calling that G Suites because I hate G Suites. That sounds dumb to say, but um, <laughs> maybe they use G Suites and Box, and they want emails to be converted into PDFs and automated to do certain things to store in certain box files. Those don't exist, you know, even from you know some you know using things like Zapier and like you're not quite getting there. So maybe. They'll spend ten, fifteen thousand dollars to build effectively a plugin, like a Chrome plugin or something, to help their workflow. That might be worth it. Uh, so we have seen that. We've seen that for years, actually. You know, you're talking about certain apps, and I, the one that kind of came to mind, um, and I was in the context of Blueprint, uh, is a good example. And I'm not saying this in any kind of, I've got any kind of relationship. I just learned about it. Uh, few weeks ago. It's Your Firm app. Have you guys heard of that? No, it's new to me. No. No, no new stuff. Let's talk new um, stuff. Let's yeah. talk new stuff. It is a uh, It's a lawyer. Uh, his name's uh, Chris Smith. He's practicing law. It has built an app and it goes to that communication tool we were talking, model I was talking about earlier as a way to, it's a, I think his model is 
hopefully I get this right. I'm sure people could fact check this by using the internet because I think that's how it works. But his concept is he has almost a SaaS type model where you can put your branding on the app and then it integrates, I believe, with Clio now. And you can use uh, Clio Connect from a, uh, a messaging standpoint and sharing of information and calendar appointments and things like that. But it has, it's not a Clio app. It's, it's for you. Well, it's called your firm app. So that makes sense. So it has your firm information on it. So you could give it to a client or you have a new client come in and you can say, download, go to the you know, Google Play, go to iOS uh, app store and download this app. And this is how we share information with you. I think that's an interesting concept. He's really early in, but uh, I think it's a cool idea. Yeah, I just uh, went and looked it up myself and it has the, like you mentioned, the practice management integration calendaring so clients can view appointments and make appointments, messaging documents, pay their bill and see their bill. This is incredible. I mean, this is a would be a real game changer for a small firm or a solo to be able to say, okay, it's all in one place go and download the app and you'll be able to to do everything on there and have total transparency for what's going on with your case. This is really cool. Chris can thank us for blowing up his concept. Yeah, <laughs> I know, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> you know, I was actually going to ask though, um, I know I just said like, oh yeah, you can go and download our app. But as former practicing attorneys, both you and Guy, how do you think clients are going to receive that? Because I know there are people in the world who are like, I don't want another thing on my phone, but do you think most clients would be receptive to something like that? I mean, I think if it's going to provide value, I would think they would go for it. What's your thought on that, Guy? Do you have any? Yeah, my thing, uh, two things. One is, and we talk about this all the time with like designing your firm's client experience is like, here, question number one. Would this work for you? Would it be a good way for us to communicate? We have this option of you downloading this app and it's here's all the advantages that it's going to provide you, right? So I think that's a step that's missed with so much of this stuff when you're talking about interfacing with your clients is no one actually asks what the client wants to do. And, right. And so, you know, what you had said, mentioned, Chad, I think is uh, right, is, you know, all of this stuff, all this technology from a, you know, client development, client relationship standpoint has to start with how is this helping the client, right? Like, how is this making it easier? Whether it's, you know, some of the big ones that come to my mind are, you know, if you're a firm that you require people to come to your office for every client communication, guess what? Like, you're, most of your clients are probably like, ugh, I got to drive to the office. You know, I'm busy with my job. I got to take a half day off. Right. I got to find childcare versus you can just send them a link to go do something that you need them to do or to some communication. So anyway, in this context, like, yeah, if you put all that stuff forward, that this app is going to help you do X, Y, and Z and make your life easier and make you more efficient. And you're not going to have to come to the office and we're going to be able to move through things faster and you're going to be able to stay up on your case. Then yeah, I think that's great. I think there's an interesting thing about this and I'm actually surprised. I actually, put the ball back in your court on this one, Chad, to, to get a sense of what you think. But I'm surprised more of the the legal tech practice management, the stuff that's, you know, client portal stuff doesn't allow lawyers to do more of like their branding on those apps. Is Because you, you, outside of legal, you see that all over the place. Like most of the apps that we right. use, they let us do that. Is that, you think that there's, is that just because they haven't really, I don't know. What do you think about that topic? You know, it, when we, so, I mean, this has been, years and years and years ago when we were using, trying to use that client portal idea out of practice management software, we had, it's going to depend on your type of client too. So obviously that matters. Going back to your, your comment, Guy, about is this something you want? It's going to depend. But we had two issues that occurred that didn't help. One is going to, if you're asking a client to integrate a new app or communication style outside of text messaging, outside of email, and it has to really be seamless and useful. And, you know, for example, we had issues with client portals, uh, and these were, these were mostly business clients for us that would say, okay, that's awesome. 
we get the value of it. We get that how everything gets, you know, to stay together in one place and that's super valuable. But guess what? I'm busy. And if you honestly think you're going to send me an email and there's going to be a link in it, and then you're going to ask me to log into something and I'm going to respond to you, it's just never going to happen. I need you to text it to me. I need you to email it to me. And that was something we ran into. And at the same time, you have to use it effectively internally. If you say, hey, use this client portal and everybody's super excited about it and you kick off this new relationship with a client because they're the most important thing in the world to you. And a couple months later, you're busy with something else and you kind of fall off you know, updating and making it a useful tool. Well, then you just ask them to you know, learn something that's actually not advancing their case or your relationship with your client. So it has to ha- be simple to use, but it also has to be something that as a firm and a lawyer, you're going to stay t- on top of and be committed to. And it's not just like another shiny object because then it looks even worse. Right. Because they're like, well, why didn't you just email me that instead of making me wonder, do I have to go to this client portal or not? Uh, those are things that we saw. So that ease of use is huge. Yeah, that's such a good point. Uh, like the, because you get this, you know, lawyers will get excited and there's all this new stuff coming out and they're, I think a lot of times people lose sight of like, yeah, it's cool, but you actually made this more difficult for the client. Right. And that's, this is why I've been lately kind of excited about the trend with at least some services, especially in the virtual assistant and scheduling world where you can fit those services into your existing workflow for example, I use a service called Fin, F-I-N. It's a virtual assistant service that is like 24 hour, 24 seven, half AI, half human, where you can ask them to do anything for you from flights to scheduling to research, whatever it is. And I can interact with them via email, via text message, or via their app. And it all ends up in the same place. I can see it in a dashboard or in the app itself, no matter how I push the information in. And so it's the same idea that we're talking about here, Finn, but it fits within my workflow almost minute to minute. For example, if I get an email from somebody and say that they want to schedule something and I can you know, hit reply, copy Finn, and now it throws into their system and they get it scheduled. Or I could take an email and forward it into their system and create a task and get it moving. Or I open the app and I hit the microphone button and I can submit a voice request that way. It fits within my world because everybody has different workflows. And those workflows could vary from you know, minute to minute or place to place, however you're working. So I think that could be really interesting if we see more of that because then the client gets to function within their systems as opposed to trying to be forced into something. Exactly. That's that's good. Don't check that out. It's new to me too. You know, I have to say going into recording this, I know we had planned to talk about apps and I had on a really cynical hat when it came to thinking about law firms using apps. And I, I'm really blown away at all of the use cases there are and all of the actual practical day-to-day purposes that a law firm could use an app for. So thank you for that, Chad. I, I, was, uh, I was a little, little bit negative on them to start off with. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Like, I, there's obviously those that are within the legal industry that we have that you put into like the legal tech type world. But I think we're also seeing a lot of more mainstream apps or applications or platforms, whatever label you want to put on it, that are just as useful, whether it's something like Trello or the virtual assistant services I was talking about. So I think we're seeing maybe, I don't know, obviously I have no idea what the adoption would look like from the standpoint of the industry if you want to put numbers on it, but at least anecdotally, it seems like lawyers are using that more and more, even if it falls outside the legal tech type world. Yeah, I agree. I've seen, I've noticed that trend too, and it's um, you know it's positive, and I think it goes back to 
which you had said at the outset, which is that, you know, lawyers are, there's this narrative of like lawyers are like anti-technology and whether it's, uh, you know, changing of the guard or just a experience or trust thing, um, you know, that's drastically changing. And I think that's a good thing. I think it's a good thing for legal services consumers. And I think it's a good thing for the practice. Right. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Well, Chad, thank you so much for sharing all of your technology knowledge with our listeners. And uh, where can people find you to get more information about the cool things your company and beyond are doing? Uh, well, first of all, thank you again for having me. This is a lot of fun. I appreciate that. Probably one way to reach me is Twitter, which is at Chad E. Burton. My email is cburton at com. That's another way to get me as well. Awesome. Thanks so much, Chad. Really appreciate this. And uh, for our listeners, as always, if you have feedback, topic suggestions, or would like to be a guest, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We'd love to hear what you're doing in terms of marketing your practices and what you're having for lunch. Thank you for listening to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. If you'd like more information about what you heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via Apple Podcasts and RSS. Follow Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And or download the free app from Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, or subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.